Okay, everyone, welcome to Oakville Ready, um, ready to weather any storm. Uh, my name is Lisa Kohler. I'm from the Halton Environmental Network. Uh, today, we're really excited about um, the community call about starting your own garden indoors. Uh, we're really pleased to be welcoming um, the Halton Food Group uh, to the call today. As a community, we have the responsibility to honor, care for, and respect all the creation gives to provide us with life. This includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. The Anishinaabek peoples have utilized this land for millennial, and we'd like to acknowledge our direct descendants, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land upon which we live, work, and conduct ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty, our treaty relationships and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which include the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee, and since European contact has and continues to become home for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals, and each other in the interest of peace and friendship and for the benefit of not only ourselves, but our future descendants. At this time, I'd like to welcome Trisha Henderson to the call. Um, Trisha Henderson is part of the Oakville Ready team and she works at the town of Oakville. Uh, without further ado, I will let Trisha take it away from here. Hey, thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to be on this call today. I am also very excited to learn from Andrea and the Halton uh, Food Council on starting my own garden. I mentioned earlier I have started mine, but it's uh, not faring all that well yet. <laughs> so I need some good advice here. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes to explain the Oakville Ready program and kind of um, how we all came to be together today. Um, so the Oakville Ready program was funded by the Oakville Community Foundation, and it's a partnership between the Town of Oakville's Climate Action and Emergency Management Department. Uh, the Halton Environment Network, and as I mentioned, it's funded by the Oakville Community Foundation. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, we, barked on, we embarked on this program um, to establish some neighborhood hubs within vulnerable areas of Oakville um, to help build neighborhood resilience against some extreme weather um, events that we've been facing and that are on the rise, uh, such as flooding, so high precipitation events, uh, high winds, which we've had at least three or four in the last two to three weeks, uh, high wind events uh, that sometimes result in power outages. Um, and then we also have um, the house fires um, that we combat on an annual basis. So really this program is put in place uh, for neighbors helping neighbors in times of need. Um, to implement uh, this pilot program, uh, we did engage a diverse uh, community of stakeholders um, with the Interfaith Council um, and just uh, neighborhood groups across town. Um, and we're really trying to learn on how, how we can work with them to increase their personal resiliency within their home and on their property and within their community on a neighborhood level. Um, and by doing this, we will increase our community capacity and resilience uh, to extreme weather. Um, Lisa, great. So the Oakville Ready program, uh, pilot program was put in place to really help alleviate some of the stress and anxiety that happens within the first one to four hours after an extreme weather event. Um, that's kind of when people don't know, should I stay home? Should I go out? Is the power going to come back on? How long are we in this for? You know, are my neighbors safe and things like that. So really in the one to four hours, all of our emergency uh, staff, all of our first responders and healthcare professionals are usually dealing with the incident and the impacts of the extreme weather event. So we really want to have um, community be able to take care of themselves and each other. It's really important in any type of emergency situation. And as we're probably all realizing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, that it's really important to have our house and our, have our homes and ourselves uh, prepared and ready for, you know, being stuck indoors for a couple of days and have enough supplies on hand, um, have some important phone numbers and things like that of people that we want to check up on. So I'm sure um, we're all, uh, you know, realizing the importance of that lately. So Oakville Ready really was put in place to deal with house fires and extreme weather events. 
Um, but in light of physical dis distancing and the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've really pivoted the program. And what we're trying to do with Oakville Ready is really build this community, this virtual community where you know, uh, we're not all going out and socializing with each other anymore. We're not going to our book clubs or our faith organizations, things like that. Um, so we're really trying to, you know, support our faith-based organizations and our neighbors um, by putting a lot of these resources online. Um, so we do have a website, it's oakvilleready.ca. Um, on that website, you can find valuable information about extreme weather events or about uh, the COVID-19, where you can go um, for information on that. And it also houses all of these webinars that we've put together so far. So there's been one on how to make your own nut and oat milk. There's been one on mindful meditation, uh, one on, um, the anxiety around being at home and being pregnant right now um, and we have a couple other exciting ones coming up that I'll talk about at the end of this presentation. Um, we also have a Oakville Ready Twitter account so you can feel free to follow us there um, and I just want to stress that if anybody um, wants any more information actually on COVID-19, the pandemic, how it's impacting Halton residents and the region, uh, please visit the Halton Region website at uh, halton.ca and if you're experiencing anything, um, personal type of symptoms, anything like that, or really need to talk to somebody um, over the phone, then uh, don't hesitate to dial 311. And they're prepared to uh, answer your calls and put you in touch with any type of social service that you might need. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we were tasked with um, establishing uh, six neighborhood hubs. We ended up getting seven uh, within our first year of the pilot project project and you can see them listed there. Um, we have learned so much uh, from each of these organizations um, and we hope that they're learning from us at, as well. So it really is a great partnership um, and uh, we've their support has been invaluable uh, throughout this process. We do uh, have additional supports from Halton Region, their Emergency Management Department, uh, Faith in the Common Good, and CREW, uh, which is um, an extreme weather neighborhood um, organization out of Toronto. So we've been learning off of our additional supports as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Andrea Rowe, and we are here about uh, growing an indoor garden together. So Andrea. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully I've unmuted my mic successfully. So at Halton Food, um, I'd like you to introduce our team to you. Here we are. So we're the newest program at Halton Environmental Network, uh, but hopefully you've seen us out in community because we have been working together in Halton neighborhoods and gardens for a few years now. So that's me in the middle picture. Um, I joined Halton Food in 2016 and I'm the community garden program manager. Um, I started out as a garden instructor in our neighborhood gardens, but I now support our uh, growing team. Helen on the left, give a wave um, in the left on the picture here. She joined our team in 2017 and she manages our Oakville, Milton, Halton Hills gardens and also teaches at the Oakville Hort Society's junior gardening program, very busy. Allison on the right, on, of your screen. She manages our Burlington Gardens. She joined the team in 2018 to deliver program uh, support and now also heads up our educational material development and leads all of our cooking programs. So our goal at Halton Food um, is to teach people how to grow their own food. We support neighborhood, community, and school gardens and collaborate with community partners to ensure the sustainability of all of our efforts. Today, since we need to stay at home, uh, we've been asked to talk to you about gardening at home. And we're really excited to share our knowledge because there are so many benefits to gardening at home. There's the mental and physical benefits of being outside, getting fresh air, sunshine, taking a break from the anxieties that we might be facing right now. And we can reconnect with nature and um, reconnect with where our food comes from. Plus, there's the excitement of seeing seeds sprout and grow into a plant. The whole transformation I find absolutely addictive and uh, check on my little seedlings probably more than they need to be checked on. In addition to all of that, as if that wasn't enough, there are the many, many health benefits of growing your own food. There's increased nutritional value and it tastes better because it's fully ripened when you pick it off the plant. 
and you pick it right when you're ready to eat it. I won't even go to, into all of the um, environmental benefits, um, but there's reduced transportation costs of getting your food to you, no need for pesticides, no need for plastic wrap on your cucumbers. Um, it just, there's so many benefits and we're so excited to be with you today. So no matter where you live, we wanna make sure that you have, um, by the end of this presentation, a few ideas of how you can grow something at home. It may not be as much as you want to grow, but every bit helps um, and provides a benefit to you and your family. So we're very excited. Um, if you have any questions uh, along the way, please use the chat box. Um, if you have any problems, um, hopefully we can help you out there. But if you do have questions, you want more information as we go along, please enter it in the chat box and uh, we'll get to your questions at the very end or hopefully some of our facilitators can answer them as we go. So let's get started. Um, as I said, no matter where you live, we want to make sure you've got access and information to uh, help you grow your own food. So I've listed uh, a number of types of different gardens that we're going to explore today. So there's the backyard or front yard garden if you're um, adventurous and you don't mind growing some Swiss chard instead of flowers in your front garden. There's lots of beautiful, beautiful flowers that you, or, um, vegetables that you can grow in place of flowers. If you don't have uh, access to a yard, you can still grow a wide range of vegetables in um, container gardens, you, but you might just have to be a bit more selective in the particular variety and even maybe the quantity that you would like to grow. So everyone can grow something inside as well. Countertop gardens are a great way to also extend the growing season throughout the fall and winter months and keep that fresh produce available um, throughout the year. So um, before we go any further, we wanna just do a quick poll and get to know our listeners or the people that are joining us today. If you could answer these two questions, that would really help us out a lot. How would you rate your gardening knowledge or your level of experience? So from top to bottom, this is your increasing green thumb. Are you a novice, a beginner? Do you have a little bit of experience, lots of experience? Or are you a master gardener and perhaps we should be looking to uh, hook you up with some of the other folks that might be listening today? As well, what type of garden are you most interested in learning how to grow this season? An in-ground garden, raised bed or container, or some countertop gardens. If we could just uh, get some feedback, that would be fantastic. I'll give you 30 seconds or so to answer that poll, give us some feedback. I need some music to play while I'm on in waiting mode here. All right, some results coming in. We're sharing the results. Okay, so we've got some beginners, no master gardeners. Oh, I'm so disappointed. All right, and lots of raised bed and container gardens. Good to know. All right, so on we go. So no matter where you're going to be growing this season, the first thing that you want to do is start to assess your site. So I've listed the three criteria that we're going to quickly review. Where are you able to grow? So we want to assess your site. Um, the, uh, the site doesn't have to all be in the same spot. You can pick and choose where you want to grow, uh, where you're able to grow, where do you have a little corner or a really sunny spot that might be good. And this is a great way to get your whole family involved. For any of you that uh, have young kids at home, get them involved. They can explore different locations in your backyard or your patio, um, take some measurements, do a quick drawing, even get them digging in the ground to see what kind of soil you have. You can also get them to evaluate where the sun is shining throughout different times of the day. Assess the sunlight conditions in the morning, at noon, in the afternoon. The sun's position is going to change a bit throughout um, the season, but in the short term, it's a great way to get them outside, observing, um, and get the kids writing down all the different changes that they see taking place in your backyard throughout the day or on your patio. 
So next, uh, we're going to determine the quality of the soil that you're dealing with. If you're planning on gardening in ground, you need to know if you have sand, clay, or loam, the nice, rich, organic soil that's black and crumbly and full of nutrients. Personally, I live in North Oakville and I have pure solid clay, so I don't even bother trying to garden in the ground. It would be like trying to garden inside a brick. So I've built a low raised bed so I can add better soil, amended with lots of compost, and I have a lot more success. I also use a lot of containers. Finally, we'll move on to assessing that uh, third criteria, how much sunlight does your garden receive? Um, most vegetables need eight to 10 hours or more of sunlight. Um, ideally, this is full afternoon sun, but as much sunlight as possible, uh, the more sunlight they get, the better it is. And Helen will go into a little bit more detail on this one in a bit. So once you've had a chance to assess those three criteria, you get to the fun part. You get to make your wish list of vegetables. Make a list of everything that you want to grow, but make sure that these crops are crops that you're actually going to eat. Now might not be the best time to experiment with vegetables that your family has never tried before, so let's stick to food that you know your family is going to need and they will actually eat. Once you have your wish list and it's been refined by a bit of that reality of your garden choices, um, you can match the vegetables to the optimal growing sites that you have. Um, if you have a sunny patch in your backyard, that's where you can grow your tomatoes. In the shady patch in the side yard, that's where you might grow some of your leafy greens. A good rule of thumb to use if you're not sure how much sunlight a particular vegetable will need um, is to um, think about if you're eating the leaves of a plant, it's going to need less sunlight than something that has to produce a flower, which then produces the vegetables such as um, cucumbers or tomatoes or uh, peppers. Those are going to need a lot more sunshine and belong in that first category of the, uh, the full sun, eight to 10 hours of sun um, that they're going to need. So we've looked at where we can grow, what we want to grow. Now we need to determine how much we can grow. One of our favorite resources um, and one that we use in most of our gardening programs is called Square Foot Gardening. We'll put the name of the book and the author um, in the resources at the end of the presentation. Or um, if somebody wants to type it in really quick, Square Foot Gardening by Mel Bartholomew, you can look him up. So the principles of square foot gardening um, examine the size of the fully grown plant and then compares that to how many can grow in a one foot by one foot plot in your garden, hence square foot garden. So this is another excellent activity that you can do at home with your kids. You can draw pictures of your ideal garden with your kids, figure out how many plants you can fit in there, then figure out how many seeds you're gonna need or starter plants that you'll need to make uh, your dream garden happen. Another great resource that we use is uh, growveg.com. This website has lots of resources for determining how many plants um, will grow in a square foot, how to grow them, so it'll give you some tips and uh, suggestions, and what plants will grow well alongside of that particular plant, and this is called companion planting. What friends, what uh, vegetables are friends with each other? So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Allison, and she can give you some more details on this topic. Thank you so much, Andrea. Hello, everybody. My name is Allison, and I'm the Burlington Garden Coordinator for Halton Food. So I want to kind of expand on some of the topics that Andrea has touched on. And I'm sure everybody's like, okay, sure. You know, I know what my favorite ones are, but how much do you really need to grow? So there's a couple of questions I always like people to kind of mull over and definitely make this a whole family affair. Get the crayons out, start scribbling on some scrap paper, you can get some chalk, go down onto your driveway, kind of draw pictures with the family, find out what your kids' favorite foods are, find out, which I'm probably sure you already know, which ones they really don't like. Because if they really don't like squash, I mean, squash is pretty awesome. I was a kid who hated squash. It's, it's better not to fight on that one. So go for things like the cherry tomatoes, which are really, really fun to plant. But we also want to ask ourselves, what type of garden? Do we want to have a kitchen garden? 
So something that we can go out onto our balcony or just walk across the kitchen, perhaps go in the backyard and pick fresh food, something that's going to help reduce your weekly budget for food, or do you want to be completely fully self-reliant in the garden? So with that, a single person is going to have, you know, not as much as a family of four, whereas a family of six is going to need to kind of expand. So I have an example here of a kitchen garden. So we've got a raised bed. Now I myself live along the escarpment in Dundas, which means I have zero soil. I have plenty of rocks. So I have tons of different things that I use around me and we'll probably elaborate on another webinar on how we can use what's around us to build a garden. But I have some raised beds, I've used some old buckets but typically a family of four, just so you can kind of go outside and cut and you know, harvest some fresh basil for maybe homemade tomato sauce, um, some parsley if you wanted to make some tabbouleh. This is a suggested growing list. So you'd want to plan for four basil, five or more parsley, again, depending on how much your family needs, one dill, one oregano plant, one rosemary, one sage, four kale, so then you can have different types of kale because some are better for putting in soups and stews, others are better for salads. Then we get into spinach, lettuce, radishes, root vegetables, and peas. Now I haven't put suggested numbers beside those because we can start doing success, succession gardening. And this means every seven days, every 10 days, every 14 or every 21, you can plant a different crop, so you always have something fresh on the go. Again, for a family of four, I'm gonna suggest four ch cherry tomato plants because they're gonna be smaller, much easier to just grab from the garden, and you don't have to wait as long for those to ripen. So I'm gonna hand it over to Helen, who's gonna talk about container gardening. Hi, yes, so some of you don't have a backyard, uh, but I'm going to suggest other ways that you might be able to grow these vegetables. So if you have a patio, a deck, or a balcony, these all work just fine for growing vegetables. Just avoid crops that take up a lot of space. So avoid your watermelons, your squash, your pumpkins. There's, uh, look for compact varieties instead, not necessarily of those vegetables, but you can get compact uh, tomato varieties, for instance, which will work much better for your smaller space. Any container will work, uh, terracotta, wood, plastic, recycled or new. The only criteria is that your container must have holes in the bottom to allow for proper drainage. Some vegetables like leafy greens, as we see here, they require uh, a smaller, shallow container. Herbs are also work well in shallow containers. But others like tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers, they require a deep container, and that's for to allow root growth and so that you can have proper moisture, which those plants need. Uh, buy a high quality potting soil or a soilless mix. Try not to use topsoil, it's very heavy and it's prone to drying out quickly. You will probably need to water every day, especially if you're using a terracotta or a ceramic container. If you do water every day, you're going to have to add some sort of compost or um, organic matter to the plants so that you can replenish the, so the nutrients in the soil that are going to be lost by the frequent watering. Uh, another way to prevent the soil from drying out too quickly is to purchase or make your own self-watering planter. So if you can see from these pictures, the pink planter and all the containers on the right are self-watering containers. So we can get into more detail about that later on, um, or we can do another presentation. Just let us know this in the chat. Uh, also, if you're on a balcony, take advantage of vertical spaces. Uh, grow up instead of out. Many plants can be trained up a bamboo pole or along a trellis. Get creative and see what you can come up with. With a little research, many vegetables can be, be found in a variety that are suitable for small spaces. So what if you have no outdoor space at all, or maybe you just want to try something new? You can try sprouts or microgreens. Sprouts are freshly germinated seeds that are grown in water. Microgreens are edible immature greens that are harvested uh, with the scissors about a month after germination. Microgreens are a power food. A lot of people are talking about power foods these days. 
Nutrient levels may be up to nine times higher in microgreens than they are in the mature plant. So many vegetables can be grown as microgreens. Your radishes, beets, broccoli, cabbage, sunflowers, any of these will work. So how do you grow them? Uh, use any shallow container and fill it with moistened uh, potting soil. Then you're going to sow the seeds liberally across the container, then press gently into the soil. You're going to cover either with more soil or a plastic clear lid. Once the sprouts have appeared, remove the lid and keep the soil moist but not wet. When the first set of true leaves arrive, that's when you can harvest. So what does that mean the true first true set of leaves? If I can show you a little picture. This is working. So the first set of leaves that come up are actually called cotyledons. And those are not your first true set of leaves. So those are just your first set of leaves. The first true set of leaves are the ones that come after that. And they're the ones that start forming the actual plant. Uh, we'll have provide additional instructions or resources at the end of the webinar, if you would like. So now we'll review the what you want to grow, where are you going to grow it, how are you going to do it. So the next part we're going to get into is the when. So before we get started on that though, we have a pop quiz, uh, just to keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> so what are the two things you need to start seeds? So maybe you have a child with you that has taken uh, needs of living things at school and can help you with this, or most of you will have some idea of what do seeds need so that they can start germination. So I'll wait 30 seconds to see if um, you can add this to the chat box, see if we get some answers in there. And don't worry, we will prov provide all this information afterwards in our, after the webinar is finished. Oh, I'm getting some answers, soil and water. Anybody else? Lots of sunlight. So actually for seeds to germinate, what you need is moisture and heat. So sunlight isn't quite as popular. Um, sunlight isn't quite as important at first because a lot of things you're planting a little bit deeper in the soil. So what you need is that the warmth and, and definitely the moisture to get the seed going. Uh, okay, so move on back to the presentation. Many vegetable seeds can be direct sown. So this means you can plant the seeds directly into the soil. And these vegetables can all be planted and harvested during our growing season here in Halton region. And I know I have, we have a few people here are from Ottawa and a few people are actually from New Jersey. And it's basically the same zones there where you're not too far out that that wouldn't apply to you as well. You just need to know when to sow based on the moisture and heat in the soil. So raised beds, they're going to warm up a little bit quicker than in-ground gardening beds. And obviously indoor gardens, well, that all depends on the heat inside your house. So whenever, whenever you're ready for that one. Lettuce, spinach, peas, radishes, those are all examples of seeds that can be planted outside as soon as the soil is ready. They don't mind the cooler spring weather. Some vegetables need a little more time than our summer provides them. So these are warm weather crops. Um, I don't actually have the slide presentation up anymore, so I'm hoping that we can still uh, see all this. Okay. So uh, yes, all these ones you're seeing here, like the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, they are all warm weather crops. And they should be, if you're gonna grow these from seed, they need to be started five to eight weeks before the last frost date. So check your seed packet for guidance for that one. So if you do start seed indoors, remember you have to harden them off before planting outdoors. So what does hardening off mean? It means you gradually increase the amount of time a plant spends outside before you move them into the garden. So what you're trying to do is increase the stem's um, tolerance to wind and you're acclimatizing the plant to cooler nighttime temperatures. Do not be in a rush to plant warm weather crops outside. The rule of thumb, especially for tomatoes, is wait for nighttime temperatures to reach about 10 degrees Celsius. Then you're safe to plant outside. If seeds are not your thing, uh, most garden centers and large grocery stores have warm weather crops like tomatoes and peppers available for immediate planting in May and June. We will have information at the end of the webinar on where you can purchase or order these plants, or seeds actually. 
Another little tip for you, in your excitement, you may be tempted to plant all your seeds at once. Uh, we recommend you stagger your plantings two weeks apart. So having four to five uh, heads of lettuce ready to harvest at once is great. Having 40 to 50 heads of lettuce that are all ready at the same time, well, that's a bit overwhelming and wasteful. But we have all been there. <laughs> we have all done this at some point in our gardening lives. So if you do happen to have way more food than your family could eat and you don't want it to go to waste, consider uh, donating to neighbors or contacting your local food bank and seeing if they can accept your donation. If you do purchase seeds from the store, the seed package contains a lot of useful information, such as planting depth and spacing between the plants, when to plant, as well as days to harvest. It'll also tell you if you can direct sow or if you need to start the seeds indoors. The, you will find an expiration date on seeds, and seeds do expire technically, but that simply means the German rate, germination rate goes down. So don't throw them away, still try them, but uh, realize you're just not gonna get as many plants as there are seeds. Uh, perhaps you picked up some seeds from a neighbor or a CD Saturday, CD Sunday. Uh, in that case, um, and you can't find any information on how to grow these, please check out some of our resources that were provided, such as growveg.com. Um, we typically plant vegetables in rows. So this is mostly so you don't confuse your precious vegetable seedlings with anything else such as weeds. If you are following the square foot gardening method, you'll probably still plant a lot of your vegetables in rows. Uh, most newly germinated seeds all look the same, so be sure to label everything very well. The seed package will tell you how deep to sow, but generally the smaller the seed, the shallower you plant it. So carrot seeds, for example, you just lightly press into the soil because they actually need a little bit of light to germinate. But beans, uh, peas, you're planting those three to four centimeters deep. If your seeds are small, like lettuce and carrots, just take a pinch and sprinkle along the row. It's kind of like adding salt to a meal. Uh, you will need to thin these later, but believe me, you will go crazy if you try to plant carrot seeds individually. Bigger seeds can be planted one at a time in appropriate sized holes. Then you're just gonna cover those seeds with soil, except for the carrots, everything else, you're gonna cover it with soil and you're gonna gently water it. Make sure you keep the soil moist until the seeds germinate. And again, remember to label all your plants. Make this a fun family activity. Paint rocks, spoons, popsicle sticks, whatever you have on hand. Um, but you will appreciate knowing where you planted what in a few weeks time. Brilliant, thank you so much, Helen. So all this talk about food is definitely making me really, really hungry. So let's do a quick survey. Type in the chat box on the side of your screen your favorite salad green. We'll give you 30 seconds. So what is your favorite salad green? Ooh, kale, love kale. <gasps> arugula, yes, arugula is my absolute favorite. Oh, two votes for arugula, excellent. Romaine, leaf lettuce, oh, more kale, more arugula. Everybody just keep saying arugula. We'll just cover every lawn in arugula. We've got spinach, oh, wonderful. Well, guess what? All of these that you're typing in right now, they are plants that you can start today. In fact, you might even find some hanging out in your refrigerator. So I'm gonna talk a little bit how we can be creative. So on the left uh, picture, we've got your in-ground bed, you know, lettuce in, in rows, but you know, we get, not everybody has a huge amount of space. I have a really small backyard and I've had to be creative using different bins and such and the picture on the right is actually using pop bottles so using something that's kind of already within our system upcycling it and you can plant in there and they're self-watering so you water from the top and then the water goes down and irrigates the plants right down to the bottom it is absolutely cool so you can be super creative with whatever space you have so let's talk about what we might actually find in our houses right now to get you guys gardening because I know I'm super excited and I want to just get my hands in the dirt. So if we could advance the slide forward, what, I, what you're going to do is you're going to go to your fridge and you're going to go to your cupboard. You're going to open it up, especially your fridge, and I did this right before the presentation and I didn't think I had something in the back of my fridge that I could kind of restart, but 
I found a really old piece of cabbage. Now, it definitely does not look really great to eat. Um, it's probably me sitting there for a better part of a week. Um, I eat very seasonal, so I eat a lot of cabbage and potatoes and onions in the winter. And let me tell you, this is telling me that I am sick of eating cabbage. But I don't want to just toss this completely into the compost. I want to start regrowing it. So what you need to look for are roots on the bottom of your plants. So this is a good sign here. Another plant you can use is lettuce, but you do need to have at least like four inches of plant material in order for it to regrow. So essentially what I would do with this is I'd find, I don't know, I have like another muffin tray. I have a lot of muffin trays around me. I would put water in the bottom of this tray, sit it in here, changing the water every single day so you don't have anything stagnant. And eventually roots are going to sprout. And then eventually you're going to move that into a pot with soil. So this one here, I actually found some really old garlic in my cupboard. So here's some garlic. You can see there's, hopefully you can see there's that little sprout coming off the side. You can still use it for cooking. But I missed my garlic planting last year. Or maybe you're just getting into gardening and you want to learn how to plant garlic. So you can take this, put this into your pot now keep it moist and then it will start to grow. And then this afternoon, what I'm going to do with shoots that are about this big, I'm gonna move it outside because this is a plant that likes the cool weather and we definitely have lots of great cool weather. Other things you can kind of find in your cupboard, onions that are left over. So perhaps your family doesn't like a lot of onions. So you're gonna cut it in half and you need about this much in order for it to regrow. And it's just like that cabbage, you're gonna put the roots in the water, changing the water every day. And once the roots have really kind of gotten a good inch on them, then you're gonna put it into soil. I'm sure we've all found one of these in our cupboards. A potato that is kind of lonely, got left behind. So we've got some really nice shoots on here. This is ready to be planted outside. I've got some broken recycling bins that I'm just gonna fill up with some soil. So I use triple mix because I'm outside. Um, you can also use potting soil as well. Adding in some extra manure, maybe you can find some grass clippings around that have been well rotted down. If you've got compost from you know, a pile in your backyard, um, just pile it all in there and the potatoes are gonna love it. And it's free food essentially. Then, so that was my refrigerator. Then I went to my cupboard and I eat a lot of beans, but then there's also the beans that have been sitting in the back of my cupboard for about two years. Um, a lot of things get lost in the back of my cupboards, but these are lima beans. I'll be honest, not my favorite. But what I did was I soaked them in water for about 24 hours first. And that told me one of two things. One, it told me, okay, they're good. They're nice and plump. I could actually cook these, but they might be a little bit hard because they're old, but because they've plumped up to about twice their size, I can then take these and plant them and then harvest the shoots. So as an example, this tray is about a week and a half old. This is an old lettuce tray here. I have two very small holes in the bottom and then it sits on top of a cookie sheet. If we can get really close, you should be able to see some peas. So those have been soaked for 24 hours. And then I just laid them on the top of the soil. And a week later, we've got great root development. I then covered them with soil. And I leave these in my windowsill, although I am kind of cheating because I do have a small greenhouse in my backyard here. But give this another week and you'll have some fresh pea shoots that you can harvest off put a couple into a smoothie in the morning. I love to put them on my salads and also in stir fries. So other crops that are really good for that are, are any of the herbs that you might get at the grocery store. Do a fresh cut off the bottom, put it in water, just like a mason jar or you know your favorite mug. Then change that water every day and eventually some roots will sprout and then you can put them into a pot and regrow them. So it's a continuous harvest. So those are some things that you can do now 
today, this afternoon, after you kind of rummaged around the house to get your garden going. So let's talk about something that I absolutely love, and it's shopping for gardening supplies. So we have a couple of really great resources in our area. Southern Ontario is like the mecca for, for small growers. So Tree and Twig, although located in Grimsby, this, this honestly is like the best place to get tomatoes if you're gaga over tomatoes. Linda has something like 400 different varieties of tomatoes, which can be a little bit overwhelming, but it's also so much fun. So she's doing online orders. You can phone her, you can email her. She's also doing by appointment. So if you're new to tomatoes and you're looking for something, you know, with a little bit more flavor than the ones at the grocery store, you can actually go to her farm and she'll do a one-on-one -on -one with you, obviously with, you know, a good amount of space in between. But she can answer a lot of those questions herself. There's going to be a Hamilton and a Burlington pickup location. And if there's enough interest, Halton Food, we're going to try and put together an Oakville pickup point for people. And then you don't have to drive all the way to Grimsby. The other great resource that is coming up is St. Luke's Anglican Church in Oakville. So they are running an online plant sale and that's gonna go until April 30th. So you can get seeds, you can get some flowers, you can get some seedlings as well. Like if you wanted to get some squash that has already started. Um, if you're looking for a larger variety, so we can go online and do lots of shopping these days, which is great. Uh, full disclosure though, most of the seed suppliers have a waiting period of somewhere between one to two weeks. I know William Dam Seeds, I was on there right before this presentation looking for stuff to order. I'm sad they're out of asparagus, um, but they have a 20 day waiting period. Um, Geek and Tea, which is my company, I am a reseller for Baker Creek and Hudson Valley Seeds. So there's some really different, weird and wacky things that you can't usually find at other places, like black tomatoes that are orange on the inside and some that have like purple streaks on them. That's, that's the geek in me. Um, Urban Harvest, they're out of Toronto. They're really fast. They've got an amazing selection. Hannah from Matchbox Seeds, if you went to the Oakville CD Sunday, she was there and she's doing lots of online sales. She actually is also in the Mustard Seed Co-op in Hamilton. A lot of her seeds are there. And Heritage Harvest Seeds, a little further away, but they also have a great selection of plants that you can order. All right, so some great news. Farmers markets, I'm sure we can all agree, are essential food services. So this was recently updated um, by the government of Ontario. But like everything, there are going to be some modifications. So we definitely want to encourage everybody to go to FarmersMarketOntario.com to find your market and to figure out which farmers are going to be doing either a drop-off at the regular market location where you can go and pick up from there. A lot of them have shifted to doing just regular deliveries like a CSA. And then others are by appointment only. You can go to their location and pick up food. Unfortunately, though, community gardens aren't yet deemed an essential service. So I'm going to be posting on our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram after this presentation. And we're asking everybody to help voice the that community gardens are essential service because there is an open letter and petition to the government by Sustain Ontario. So we would absolutely love all your support for that. But you need to find us first. So after this or during this presentation, make sure to follow us on Instagram at halton.food. I'm usually the voice behind all the quirky messages there. I am doing some kind of like, I guess it's a video blog about the gardening that I'm doing in my backyard. I'm growing gar or ginger for the very first time, so that's exciting. Follow us on Twitter at Halton Food. Of course, our Facebook at Halton Food, and I'll be on the Facebook group for about half an hour after this presentation to answer any extra questions people have. And we're currently working on our website, so stay tuned for that, but you can find us at haltonfood.ca. 
couple other great resources, check out the Facebook group called Halton Gardeners. This is an amazing group. Every single level of gardening from like novice to expert on there. A lot of times in the spring, there's seed swaps happening. So you can mail seeds back and forth to each other. There's also people that are dividing strawberries in their yard and you can get free plants. But yeah, lots of great resources there. Um, talk to your local master gardeners, horticultural societies, and also Royal Botanical Gardens. You can phone in, email them. They've got a gardening hotline and they'll answer a lot of questions there. Oh, there's our little kohlrabi. So here's a couple extra resources. Again, this presentation is gonna be posted afterwards, but if you wanted more info about food scraps, you can go to Food Revolution, Growing Spreads that Helen was talking about, and microgreens, either spreading.com and West Coast Seeds. So I will turn this to our very last survey. We wanna know what you wanna know. So we've got questions on the go. We're gonna to get to a couple of those shortly. But we want to do a whole series of webinars for you guys. Let us know either in the chat box there or send me an email at grow at haltonfood.ca and tell us what you want. We can, we can put something together for you. While we wait to answer their Love that. Thank you, Lisa Meacham. Thank you. <laughs> so, Allison, we had someone um, have with a question about what sure. to grow in self-watering containers and to expand a little bit on that. Do you or Helen want to field that question? Helen, do you want to jump in since you were talking about container gardening? Yes. Hi. Um, what to grow in self-watering containers? Yes, and where to place them. Ah, yes. Okay. So where to place them. Uh, again, it depends what you're growing, but pretty much you can grow anything in a raised bed, a self-watering container, depends on the size of it. But um, if it's tomatoes, which can, as long as the depth is big enough, uh, then you can plant that in full sun or put that right in full sun. Um, if it's a little bit shallower, you can do your lettuce and that can go in part sun. Uh, if you have something on wheels, you can push it around your yard or on your balcony if maybe the corner gets a lot of sun and then later on the day, this corner gets the sun as the sun moves. Um, pretty much anything can grow in a self-watering container as long as the container is the right size, except for I wouldn't grow corn. I wouldn't grow anything that takes up a lot of room, like I said before, like your watermelons, your squash, your pumpkins. But uh, peppers, definitely. Tomatoes, definitely. Um, certainly herbs, uh, leaky greens, radishes, beets, carrots, if your container is deep enough, all those will work. Mm -hmm. We're getting some great questions on here. Like yeah. lots of really great questions. I'm so excited. Right. <laughs> um, just to expand on that, I make my own self-watering containers and uh, perhaps we could do another full webinar just on oh. that. Um, I simply get two buckets that nest inside of each other, drill holes in the one that, um, contains the soil and the plant, and the roots will grow down through that first bucket into the bottom one, which becomes your water reservoir. So the water goes in the bottom one, and those roots, they sense the water. They instinctively will grow towards that, um, and so you can very easily make your own. Any two containers that nest inside of each other, Tupperware, buckets that you've got lying around, anything can be turned into a self-watering container. So I'm going to answer a couple of questions that I can see here. Let me just expand my chat box because they got really big here. Management questions for you. Integrated pest management. That is a very, very long topic. And we will definitely need to do an entire webinar just on that. Um, so that is my specialty. My master's was in integrative pest management. So I could talk for hours about that. Um, but I'm seeing a common thread of like bunnies, and squirrels, and raccoons coming up. Part of gardening is embracing wildlife. <laughs> I know when you put in so much work, it is absolutely devastating. 
especially when you plant things like tulips and all you want to see are these beautiful flowers and then along come the squirrels and just as that flower is supposed to open it's off the top of the head um of the flower <laughs> yeah being in the city you've got lots of those animals around you i'm out in a forest chipmunks are the things that get into everything that i have Putting very simple practices, getting some chicken wire, creating a couple of physical barriers. You can get fruit netting, which there's a biodegradable fruit netting, but there's also the plastic heavier one. Put that over top of, let's like, say, any of your fruit crops to stop um, the birds and all the rodents from getting at them. Raised beds are great because you can actually put the chicken wire completely underneath so nothing can kind of dig from the bottom up into your raised bed. And then you're gonna have some landscaping cloth as well underneath. For things such as cucumber beetles, um, like your cabbage, white moths, those sort of things, you wanna invest in something called a floating row cover. And it's essentially, um, I don't have one around, around me, but it's a very, very light sheet. Um, it's going to let the water through, the light through, but it's not going to allow any of the bugs to get in. Now, with that said, if there's bugs underneath, they're going to be trapped in there as long as you're very diligent about keeping the cover on and replacing it right away after you do an inspection. For the, bug, the insects that are on the ground, they've got a life cycle. So you actually be able to determine that like four to six week cycle from when the eggs have hatched into the larvae, they've gone through their different instars to go to the flying insect. And it's, you're wanting to trap that flying insect in that crop. So there's a little bit of a sacrifice in a crop happening, especially on cabbages and kale, but you trap them there. And the idea is it's preventing it from going somewhere else. Um, see what other questions here um, so we also assess with your vegetables what um, I know at as Andrea mentioned I teach at the junior garden or not this year but the junior garden um, and we had a lot of problem with flea beetles eating um, our radish leaves and our beet leaves it's cosmetic so it, at the end of the day the vegetables are still going to grow so did it look very it, it looked full of holes it didn't look great everybody says oh what are you going to do about this and I said, nothing, just wait, your vegetable's still gonna grow and it's gonna be just fine. Yeah, so Angie just mentioned she plants extra for bunnies. Um, yes, Tracy Skelton, I always, I always plant more than what I need knowing that I'm going to lose a certain amount to the animals and lose a certain amount to other people, possibly. Um, so I'm talking about our community gardens and at home, losing it to, I forgot to water that corner of the garden. It happens, you know. Um, what are the questions here? How to uh, deal with tying taller plants. So I think we could probably do a whole webinar on just tomato pruning, for example. Um, yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, Helen, Andrea, do you guys wanna talk a little bit about where somebody can get compost? Usually they get them at the town pickup, but it is currently suspended. So I'm not in Oakville. I don't really know what places to suggest for you guys. There are a lot of um, nurseries that are still doing deliveries. Um, it's contactless, obviously. And there's a lot of uh, nurseries that are open for contactless delivery. You put in your order and they tell you when to come and then you just pull up, pop open your trunk and they put it in a bag. So it is bagged which isn't as great for the environment. So you're better to get uh, a yard delivered to your house. But obviously if you live in a condo and you're just starting in pots and you need that soilless mixture or you just have a very small backyard and the yard is ridiculously expensive and way too much for you, you'll want to pick up a bag or two using the contactless delivery, contactless delivery system that they've got in place. Yes, the town's compost was, was great and maybe they'll read yeah because I think this they can work out a way to make it contactless but they're not quite there yet so we'll just give it a bit more time. Would people be interested in a webinar on starting a small at home compost whether you're in you have a, like an apartment in a balcony because we could talk about vermiculture at that point or then also starting something in your backyard. 
Yes, Allison, we have had a few people ask for that. Okay. So. A lot of great questions here. Um, where was it? There was one, somebody had asked about irrigation of their crops. Absolutely. So um, a couple of years ago, I grew like 30 different tomatoes because because I like tomatoes. I don't necessarily eat them all. They're just beautiful to look at. And I give them away to friends and family. Um, but my front porch is about four feet off the ground. And like I had mentioned earlier, I don't have any soil because I live on the escarpment. So I took the garden planters that usually hang over the railings. I set those up also on the bottom of the balcony porch there. And I bought an irrigation system from Canadian Tire. It's called Rainbird, and it's like cut and plugged together. And I hooked it up to my, um, my cistern here, put a timer on it. And then in the morning, I had it for at about, it was like five or six o'clock in the morning. And it just very gently drips into each container uh, for about 15 minutes. And then again in the evening. Occasionally in July and August, I would have to turn it on in the middle of the day. But I like to make things easy for me. I don't, I mean, personally, I don't want to spend my entire day watering because at that point I was super busy. Now I have like all the time in the world, so I'd be glad to do it. But absolutely, if you want to set up some drip lines, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do. Most of the kits come with instructions and there's, a, there's an amazing number of webinars already online where you can set up home irrigation. Right. All right, we are out of time, but we are not out of information or the desire to connect with people. So if we haven't answered your questions, please email us at grow at haltonfood.ca. Um, I've given a few people my email address as well for specific questions that they've asked. It's Andrea at Halton Food, um, sorry, haltonenvironment.ca. Um, and we will get back to you. Check our website and Twitter for all of uh, the additional suggestions and upcoming webinars. Thank you so much um, to Halton Region for the funding that uh, keeps this great program going and for Halton Environmental Network for your support and for taking us on as your newest program. We hope uh, everybody learned something today and will connect with us in the future. Thank you and uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. So thanks everyone again for joining us today on the Oakville Ready call. We are so excited to have this topic covered. We can't wait to have more gardening uh, workshops coming very, very soon. Thanks for all your fantastic suggestions. Um, again, uh, this webinar has been recorded. We will be sharing it on the Oakville Ready website. That's www.oakvilleready.ca. If you go under the general resources tab, uh, there'll be webinars. Simply click on that and you can see all the webinars we have been connecting uh, with the community uh, since uh, the pandemic. So please feel free to check that out. As well, we're super excited this week. We are welcoming Julia Hanna uh, to our community call. Uh, Julia, a very famous restaurateur here in Oakville, a dynamic woman, has a cooking show. She's gonna teach us how to cook from our pantry and she is sharing her very uh, special uh, gnocchi recipe uh, for us all so we can use those potatoes that Allison showed us how to grow in our backyards now to make something amazing and delicious. As well, she will also be um, helping us uh, use some uh, items from our pantry to create a couple different sauces as well. So we're super excited for that uh, webinar. Again, that's this Thursday. You can check out our website, our Twitter as well. Our Twitter account is at Oakville Ready. If you have any questions about Oakville Ready, our program, and what we're trying to do for community by connecting us all at this time, please feel free to reach out to Tricia Henderson. Her email is there from the town of Oakville, or you can always reach out to me. I'm Lisa from the Halton Environmental Network. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We had a great time. We hope you did too. Be well, stay safe, and until next time, thanks so much.